Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. If there is one thing that I have learned from the research on my videos, it's that the internet highway can be a very dangerous place. There are constantly new scams out there made by people seeking to get your information and location. It's getting to a point that using the internet without a VPN is like driving a car without a seatbelt. It's not safe and can have disastrous consequences. NordVPN is not only a safe and trusted name in online protection, but it is also often rated as one of the top VPNs in security, cost, and privacy year after year. It's easy to understand why. When NordVPN has over 5,800 servers in over 60 countries, giving you the means to connect to a server close by for faster speeds, or one in an entirely different country to access content that you previously couldn't. NordVPN offers more than just ease and convenience as well. They also take your security and privacy incredibly serious by including double VPN coverage that increases the encryption protection, diskless drivers that never store your data, threat protection from ads, malware, and web trackers. This also blocks people who attempt to spy or even stalk you online. NordVPN can also aid you in the means of entertainment. After all, we all love kicking back and watching our favorite shows or movies after a long day. Well, with NordVPN, you can not only connect to another server and access their content for your viewing pleasure, but it can even allow you to find a streaming platform at a lower price. One of my personal favorite things about NordVPN is that you don't have to deal with bandwidth throttling. Since NordVPN encrypts all of your traffic, your internet service provider can't slow down your speeds. You also don't have to worry if your device qualifies, as NordVPN works on Mac OS, Android, Linux, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and even Android TV. If all of this sounds like a good deal to you, then visit nordvpn.com forward slash cadaver. The link is in the description to get a two-year plan plus one additional month for free. You will also receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. Once again, use the link below to get a 30-day money-back guarantee. The world has no shortage of stories that can shock, sadden, and scare us. Stories that make us wonder how we would feel or act if put in those situations. Stories that make us realize just how quickly a person's life can change, where one minute we are going about our day-to-day -day lives, and the next minute we are faced with something that has the possibility of cutting our life very short. The stories that you are about to hear are those that range from both old to very recent, some having closure, where others are still either ongoing or remain blanketed in the cover of being unsolved. These are four shocking stories and twisted tales. Say what you will about TikTok, whether you love it or hate it, it is easily one of the most popular forms of entertainment available today. I know there is no need for me to go into the details of what TikTok is, so I won't waste anyone's time with that. We all know it's a place for funny, creative, and interesting videos. In the past few years, there has been an explosion of content creators on the platform that have gone from accounts nobody knew of to viral sensations with millions of followers. One of those creators who went by the handle GenKid was someone who I remember seeing on my own For You page, particularly his Skyrim videos. They were honestly very funny, and anybody who has played Skyrim will no doubt find the humor in his videos as well. Apart from those videos, he also did impersonations, including movie characters like Tony Montana and John Wick. Jenkid, otherwise known as Ali Nassar Abulaban, ran the account and frequently included his wife, Anna Marie Abulaban. Together, the couple seemed to be living the life that so many of us wish to have. They had what appeared to be the perfect drama-free relationship. They lived in an upscale neighborhood in San Diego in a luxury apartment complex and they both appeared to be doing what they loved. It was obvious that comedy was a strong passion of Ali's, and he quickly began to develop a fan base that saw each upload of his on both his TikTok and YouTube accounts skyrocket as his popularity increased. 
But the unfortunate thing about the online lifestyle is that they often only show the happy and good sides of life, and never the ugly parts. And for some couples, the dark and ugly side tend to outweigh the bright and beautiful side. And unfortunately, Ali and Anna fell into that latter category. From what was seen on the screens of the loyal followers of Ali was a far cry from the nightmare that Anna was finding herself in far too often. And not just Anna was subject to horrible things, but the couple's five-year-old daughter, who was also included in several of Ali's TikToks, no doubt witnessed the abuse and fighting that took place inside of the Abulaban's home. The arguments that would take place between Ali and Anna would unfortunately escalate from heated arguments to physical violence. In a three-month period, there were nine separate phone calls made to the police, all revolving around the same thing, a domestic violence situation. The situations differed from one instance of Ali smacking Anna in the face to another where Ali actually pushed Anna into a wall. The incredibly frustrating part here is that in those nine separate times that police were called, all for the same thing, in all of those nine different times, Ali was never arrested and Anna was left in the environment that she desperately wanted freedom from. One of the incidents that occurred during these three months was when one night Anna ran to one of her neighbors who lived down the hall and asked them if she could use their phone to call the police because during a fight, Ali took and broke Anna's phone. Once again, police were called and even though there was clear evidence of abuse happening, nothing was done to Ali and he continued to stay in the house. The troubling thing about all of this is that during these three months, while the abuse was going on, Ali was still regularly uploading his videos to both his TikTok and his YouTube accounts, acting as if nothing had been going on, and to those watching his videos and laughing, they had no idea of the horror that he was inflicting on both his wife and his daughter on numerous occasions. On October 18th, 2021, Anna, seemingly at her emotional end to the abuse that she was suffering, told Ali to move out of their apartment and that she was pursuing a divorce. Ali, not surprisingly, wasn't happy about this and tried talking Anna out of this decision. Anna was even threatening getting a restraining order against him, which no doubt could have impacted him not seeing their daughter at all. Fearing this, Ali agreed to move out of the apartment and get a hotel nearby. I am not sure if Ali was hoping that the separation would give the couple enough space so that in time they could eventually work things out, but it seemed to Anna that she was for sure moving forward with the divorce and was making moves for that to happen. I believe Anna had long since made her decision to leave the marriage, and I don't think anybody can blame her. Before Ali moved out though, he secretly made a copy of their apartment key and three days later, on October 21st, 2021, he went back to the apartment and once inside, using his copied key, he wrecked the place. Proving that even though Ali could lie and try to tell Anna that he would change and become a better husband and father, that deep down, he was just a coward who resorted to harming those that he should have only ever shown love and compassion. After finishing wrecking the apartment, Ali installed an app on his daughter's iPad that allowed him to remotely listen in on what was going on in the apartment. After doing this, he left and went back to his hotel. Now, I am not sure if Ali trashed the apartment because he wanted to send a message to Anna to not go through with the divorce, or if it was a scare tactic to have it appear someone broke in and she would ask him to move back in. I am under the impression that Anna never knew Ali had a key, so perhaps to Ali, that was a rational thought. Later that same day, while back at his hotel, Ali decided to open the application that he had installed on his daughter's iPad and listen in, essentially spying on Anna at this point, and what Ali expected to hear, which could have been Anna crying or being angry, instead, he heard laughing. And it was Anna. And she wasn't alone. Ali then heard a man's voice and again, more laughter. Blinded by rage, Ali quickly grabbed his keys and made his way to the apartment. As Ali arrived at the apartment complex and got out of the car, he had something else with him, a gun. Ali stormed up to the apartment that he and Anna once shared together. Ali rushed in the door and saw Anna sitting on the couch with a man. 
This man was 29-year-old Rayburn Barron. Now this is where the story gets a little messy, as according to Ali, Rayburn actually had his arm around Anna and they were seen kissing on the couch. Yet, I have read in other reports that they were simply sitting on the couch talking, that Rayburn was sitting on the couch and Anna was in the kitchen, and that Rayburn and Anna were in bed together. So what Rayburn and Anna were doing is anyone's guess. But the moment Ali saw Rayburn with Anna, he saw red. The next thing anybody knew, shots were heard echoing from the apartment. After four shots, Anna and Rayburn were dead, and Ali ran out of the apartment, out the front door, got in his car, and sped off. Neighbors heard the shots and quickly called police. Once police and EMTs arrived, they pronounced both Anna and Rayburn dead on the scene. Police, knowing Anna's frequent calls about domestic abuse and now seeing that she and another man are dead in the apartment that she shared with Ali, it didn't take a genius for them to know who they needed to be looking for. At this exact same time, Ali was rushing to the school that his daughter attended. While he was on the way there, Ali called his mother and confessed to what he had done and that he didn't know what to do. Once he picked up his daughter, he told her that he hurt mommy. And then they began to drive. I can't imagine what was going on through that little girl's mind when she was told by her own father that he had hurt mommy. After driving for around 45 minutes, police located Ali and quickly surrounded his car. With their weapons drawn, but knowing that his daughter was in the back seat, they began to reason with him to get out of the car and surrender. And thankfully, Ali did, and didn't decide to go out another way. His daughter was quickly grabbed by the police and taken to safety, and Ali was arrested. With the overwhelming evidence of having the weapon used in the crime in his possession, the frequent reports of abuse made by Anna to police in the months prior, the fact that Anna was moving forward with a divorce, and even having security camera footage of Ali fleeing that apartment, you would think that this would be an open and shut case, given the evidence presented. Yet shockingly, Ali went on to plead not guilty. In fact, Ali himself tried to move the blame completely from him and instead blame Anna for the cause of everything that happened. It's almost as if Ali thinks that due to his social media presence and fame that he can turn this thing around and actually boost his career and get more people talking about him. I think that he truly feels that he was the victim here and that what he did to Anna was out of love and that she was the reason he did what he did because she was trying to push him out of her life. It shows that Ali Nassar Abulaban cares for nothing but himself, that he can't even own up to the crime he committed and will lash out at anyone who says different. There was even an example of this this year on January 25th, when during a preliminary hearing, a police officer took the stand and was asked if Ali had experienced a traumatic event, and the police officer's response was, yeah, one that he created. And according to reports, Ali went into a full-on rage and began screaming at the officer. Ali, not seeming to be one to shy away from showing that he does have a temper, shockingly agreed to be interviewed and it went anything but calm. But what were you thinking? As you're driving to the apartment. I'm driving, I'm screaming, I'm crying. I'm like, don't do it. What happens when you get to the apartment? I go up. What did you think? What did you think?
Ali Nassar Abulaban was later charged and he will go to trial and there is a possibility that if he is convicted then he could receive the death penalty. This case is still ongoing though and from what I have found the trial itself has not even begun yet. I am sure in the coming months more will come to light about the trial itself and what will happen to the monster who used to bring a smile to so many faces. I hope that Ali and Anna's daughter is getting the support and love that she both needs and deserves and I hope that the media themselves do not try throwing her into the spotlight because I think that is one of the last things that that little girl needs. This story goes to show that you never really know what a person can be capable of or who someone may be once the camera is not on them. Ali Nassar Abulaban or Jen Kid had a very bright future. He had a loving and beautiful family and he was in a position where his passion was his full-time job. A gift that not many people can say they experience. And he destroyed all of it, leaving a path of destruction once the smoke had finally cleared. Need something? Need something? Need something? Need something? Looking to protect yourself or deal some damage? Where, hey, where'd you go? The story of Dorothy Jane Scott sounds like something straight out of a modern horror movie and when I was reading her story I couldn't help but see the comparisons in her story to that of a plotline from a movie that we have all seen at one point or another. What happened to her was both horrifying and had a sense of drama to it or something straight out of Hollywood. Dorothy Jane Scott was one of those people who was just naturally kind and caring being described by her family and friends as someone who very much wanted to live a quiet life, being devoted to both her religion and her son. Dorothy was a single mother living in Stanton, California. She was 43 years old and worked two jobs to support herself and her son. From everyone who knew Dorothy, nothing seemed out of place in her life. She was simply an independent and caring woman who was doing her best to make ends meet and not live a life in the spotlight. She was known to never drink, do drugs, or even date that often according to her parents, which is what made the series of events that led to May 28, 1980 even more shocking. But before I get there, I need to go back a few months, three to be exact to show what all Dorothy had been going through and how her life went from normal to a living nightmare. It all started when Dorothy began receiving phone calls from a stranger, a man claiming to know where she was always, her daily routine, where she lived, worked, and even where her parents lived. Dorothy was aware that she had a stalker, but unfortunately, back in the 80s, stalking was not taken that seriously at least nowhere near how it is today. And even today, from stories personal friends of mine have told me, if you have a stalker, you must jump through so many hoops to have anything done about it that it almost makes the entire ordeal not even worth the energy. Dorothy may have known this to be the case as well, even back then, because for several months she had been receiving these phone calls. The calls would range from devotion to rage. The caller would never stay on the line for long, but when he did call, he was either confessing his love for her or telling her that he was going to harm her. It got so bad that police got involved and installed a recorder on her phone line, but as I just mentioned, the calls were so short that there was never a way for them to trace the call. One of the biggest scares that Dorothy went through came a few weeks after installing that recorder. Dorothy's phone rang and the voice told her to go outside because he had something for her. 
Dorothy, both scared and angry, went outside and quickly saw that on her car's windshield was a dead rose. And it didn't stop there either. About a week later, Dorothy received another call from the stranger who claimed that he would get her alone and in his words, cut her up into little bits so no one would ever find her. It had gotten so bad by this point that Dorothy had started to take up karate lessons for self-defense and was considering purchasing a handgun. Why this really impacts me with researching this topic is it went from a woman who would seemingly never have harmed anyone to now being someone who must consider going to these measures to ensure her protection. I am not saying that she is wrong or going overboard by doing this. I just found it sad how much this woman had to alter her life because of this stranger who was tormenting her. All of this finally led to May 28, 1980. That night, while at a work meeting, Dorothy noticed that one of her co-workers seemed very sick. Come to find out, her co-worker, Conrad Bostron, had been bitten by a spider. Being the thoughtful and caring woman that Dorothy was, she, along with another co-worker, Pam Head, took Conrad to the hospital for treatment. While there, it was reported later by Pam that Dorothy never left her side and that while they were there waiting, they sat beside each other and Dorothy appeared to be behaving normally. After Conrad was treated, Dorothy said that she would go outside to pull the car up so he wouldn't have to walk that far in his condition. Pam stayed behind to wait with Conrad and when Pam and Conrad walked out of the front entrance, they saw Dorothy's car and the next thing they knew, the car turned on its high beams and sped past Pam and Conrad. The car then made a sudden turn out of the parking lot and took off down the road. Now at this moment, Pam had no knowledge of what was going on with Dorothy and her stalker. In fact, neither Conrad or Pam even reported Dorothy as missing until hours later, and this was because they had originally thought an emergency could have happened with Dorothy's son, and that is why she left in such a hurry. However, when Pam found out a few hours later that nobody had seen Dorothy, the police were notified. Around 4.30 a.m. on May 29th, around five hours after Dorothy was last seen, her car was found 10 miles away from the hospital engulfed in flames, and no sign of Dorothy was ever reported that morning or in the following days. Two weeks after Dorothy's disappearance and apparent abduction, the phone calls began again but this time it was to Dorothy's mother, Vera. The call started with, Are you related to Dorothy Scott? Well, I've got her. Following these phone calls, Vera began to receive them almost every Wednesday afternoon, and with the more the stranger called, the more details he told to Vera. One example being that on the night Dorothy disappeared, before she got to the hospital, she actually ran by her house to change scarves. She was originally wearing a thinner black scarf. She later changed it for a thicker red one. The stranger told Vera that he knew the color scarf that she was wearing when she went to her work meeting, that she went home to change, and then what she was wearing when he took her. This was among other details that the caller gave Vera that were not given to the media, incriminating him more in being responsible for Dorothy's nightmare and eventual abduction. During this time in the following weeks since Dorothy went missing, the police were adamant on Vera and Jacob, Dorothy's parents, to not give any details to the media as it could severely hinder the case. But with no progress seeming to be made, Jacob Scott finally gave in and contacted the local newspaper to spread some information about the case in hopes of getting some answers to finding his daughter. The day a newspaper ran the story, Vera received a phone call from the same man and he finally gave some insights as to why he did what he did. He claimed that he and Dorothy were in a relationship and that she was cheating on him. This was never proven or even known for that matter. Vera and Jacob didn't know much about Dorothy's dating life and had no idea of if what the caller was saying was true or not. Although they did lean on the side of not believing him simply because they knew their daughter and wouldn't see why she would keep a relationship secret, granted it could be possible, but it could also be that this stalker felt betrayed by Dorothy, that she may have gone on a date with another man, and she truly may have never even known who the stalker was, but to him, she belonged to him, and he saw any potential man as a threat. 
The case of Dorothy stayed cold for another four years following the discovery of her car. Yet that whole time, Vera still received phone calls. For four years, the stranger, seemingly never tiring of the pain that he continued inflicting on the family. Things seemingly changed though in April of 1984, when yet again another call was made to Vera. Yet this time, Jacob answered the phone and the caller immediately hung up. For the next several months, the calls seemingly stopped. That was until August 6th, 1984. When skeletal remains were found near a construction site, the odd thing that was noticed by police was that there were two sets of bones, one human and the other belonging to a dog. The dog remains were seemingly buried on top of the human remains. The bones showed signs of being burned, which told police that they had been there for at least two years, as in 1982 there had been a fire in that area. The remains were eventually able to be identified as belonging to Dorothy Jane Scott. The dog bones are a mystery still to this day, as Dorothy did not own a dog, and neither did her parents. There was also a ring found with the remains that was later identified by Vera as belonging to Dorothy, as well as a watch that had stopped at 12.32 a.m. on May 29th, just an hour after Dorothy originally disappeared. The location of where the remains were found was around 10 miles from where Dorothy's car was discovered. Having some closure that they could finally, at least, bury their daughter, Vera and Jacob still continued to receive phone calls from the one claiming to be responsible for what happened. One day, Vera received yet another phone call, and the caller simply asked, Is Dorothy there? Since 1984, there have been no breakthroughs on the case of Dorothy Jane Scott. Sadly, both Vera and Jacob have since passed away never knowing justice, and never being able to identify the one responsible. However, there is one theory on this matter. While there is nothing concrete or any viable proof that it happened, it was enough for people to run with it as a theory. There was a man named Mike Butler who was believed by Dorothy's son to be the one responsible for what happened to his mother. The reason for his name even being mentioned was that Mike Butler had a sister who worked with Dorothy. From several accounts, many said that Mike had become obsessed with Dorothy. He was described as a very unstable man who was said to have been involved in cult activities. This fueled the theory even more given that many say the remains of both dog and human remains were cult-like in nature. Another important part of this theory was that Jacob had actually met Mike on several occasions and spoken with him. This played into the theory of why the caller hung up when Jacob answered the phone, since if it was in fact Mike who was making these calls, then he feared Jacob would recognize his voice. This I can see as being a reason why. After all, he had no issue calling and taunting Vera for years. But the moment Jacob answered the phone, he hung up and then didn't call again for months. The theory goes further and says that the reason for what happened to Dorothy on the night she disappeared was because Mike saw her leaving work with Conrad. He assumed that she was with another man and that could have sent him over the edge. Yet all of this is speculation and even though police were well aware of him, there was no concrete evidence linking Mike to this crime. Mike Butler died in 2014, so there is little they can do on that end anyway. If Mike was the one responsible, or if it was someone completely different, then hopefully one day this case can be marked as closed. But until then, the story of Dorothy Jane Scott will continue to live on in this state of limbo. The old expression of a picture being worth a thousand words has stood the test of time repeatedly. From the 1932 picture of lunch atop a skyscraper, the 1989 photo of Tank Man, and the 1936 photograph of Migrant Mother are just a few iconic pictures that have etched their way into history. 
There are hundreds of pictures that have been cemented in our brains that depict joy, sadness, courage, and overall, life. In 2014, 22-year-old college student Darsh Patel took a picture. It wasn't a beautiful shot of nature or a group picture with his friends. Instead, it was a picture of a bear. And that bear would be the reason why Darsh would never leave those woods alive. On September 21st, 2014, Darsh Patel went hiking in the Apshawa Preserve in West Milford, New Jersey. Along with his four friends, the group enjoyed the natural beauty of the area and were spending the day walking the various trails. A couple, separate from Darsh's group, were also walking on the preserve when they noticed that a massive black bear was nearby. Knowing of how dangerous that situation could be, the couple turned around and made their way out of the area. That same couple quickly ran into Darsh and his friends and warned them of the bear sighting and insisted they turn around also. Unfortunately, Darsh and his friends continued their path and wanted to see the bear for themselves. Not long after this, they did in fact see the massive 300-pound black bear and from what they thought was a safe distance, began to take pictures of it. This was the final photograph that Darsh Patel took. At this point, the bear was less than 30 feet away from them. Realizing that the bear was slowly approaching, the group decided to start making their way back out of the preserve. As they did this, they kept noticing that the bear was quickly closing the distance behind them. Then, the worst thing that could have happened, did. The bear broke out into a full sprint. It may come as either a little shock or a complete surprise, but bears, despite their size, can move very quickly, upwards of 35 miles per hour. For reference, Usain Bolt, who many regard as the fastest human in the world, can only run 27 miles per hour. Running from a bear is what many consider fatal, and they will not be able to beat it in a foot race, and that the only hope is to try to get to an elevated position where the bear cannot climb. Darsh and his friends broke into a full-on run and eventually the group got separated. Darsh was the unfortunate one that the bear decided to pursue. Darsh was last seen by his friends attempting to climb a rock and was yelling at his friends to keep running. After his friends made it to the end of the preserve, they noticed that Darsh wasn't there. His friends quickly called police and once they arrived, they began searching the area on high alert, knowing what was stalking around in the woods. About two hours after police arrived, they found the bear, as well as the lifeless body of Darsh Patel. The bear was put down by police, and after confirming the area was clear, Darsh's body was recovered, and his phone was able to be salvaged. Even though the phone itself had a bite mark in it from the bear, it was still able to have its contents removed, which in turn led to those pictures that Darsh took to be released to the public. After the tragic event, many were puzzled that the attack even took place. Darsh's friends insisted they did nothing to provoke the bear, and even then, most bears are typically fearful of humans, especially black bears. The Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources had this to say about the attack. Most bear attacks are defensive, and the bear provides many warning signs. Predatory attacks do not have the same warning signs and can escalate without much warning at all. Lynn Rogers, a biologist with the Wildlife Research Institute, was quoted as saying about one black bear out of a million would have done that. Which makes sense, given that in the past century, there have only been six recorded black bear attacks. This truly looks like it was ultimately a very unfortunate and tragic event. If any of you are avid hikers, take this story as a warning to always be careful and observant when in an area where potential predators call home. The story of Mary Vincent has been labeled by many as proof that evil does in fact exist in our world and that those who are responsible for these acts do not look like the monsters that movies depict. 
but instead, they don't stand out. In fact, they blend in, appearing as anyone, someone who you could see at the movies, or at a bar, or at a football game. They are hardly ever easy to spot, and rarely do these people allow anyone to see their evil side. Just like the three people that you are seeing on screen right now. Normal looking people, right? Would you be surprised to know that all three of them have one thing in common? They're all serial killers. Don't be embarrassed or feel dumb for not knowing. Because as I said, evil people don't just stand out as, well, evil. The point that I am trying to make here is that when Mary Vincent got into a van belonging to a man named Lawrence Singleton on September 29th, 1978, she had no idea that she was getting into the car with someone that many have since claimed to be a walking version of rage, hate, and you guessed it, evil. Mary Vincent was 15 at the time and was hitchhiking from Las Vegas, Nevada to Berkeley, California. An over 500 mile distance that would have easily taken her over a week on foot. Mary was going through a bitter time in her young life. Her parents were going through a divorce, her boyfriend had recently been arrested, and at one point Mary was homeless and sleeping in abandoned cars. Deciding that she needed to make a change for herself, she figured a new location to start over would be a great way to do that. So she packed what she had and started making her way to her grandmother's house in Berkeley, California. Hitchhiking along the way, and as risky as we all know it is today, it was simply a different time back then. She actually made it to her grandmother's, yet while she was there she grew homesick and decided to hitchhike back to Las Vegas. A choice that would change her life forever. While making her way back home, a van slowed down beside her and offered her a lift. The driver was a man by the name of Lawrence Singleton. Appearing to be a friendly man, greeting Mary with a smile, and even telling her that he had a daughter her age and wouldn't want her doing something as risky as hitchhiking. He told her that he was going to Reno, but had no problem taking her to Las Vegas. Little did Mary know, but Lawrence was just out of his second divorce. He did in fact have a daughter Mary's age, but the relationship he had with her was anything but close. He also had a serious history with abuse. Mary was unaware of all of this as she got in the passenger seat. As the trip started, all seemed normal, yet things took a very creepy turn when Lawrence put his hand on the back of Mary's neck and asked if she felt all right. Mary, not liking to be touched, brushed away his hand and told him not to touch her again. Lawrence apologized and that was enough to Mary. She eventually settled in and took a nap. As the trip continued, the van eventually came to a stop and Lawrence told Mary that he had to use the bathroom. Mary exited the vehicle while he did this and began to stretch her legs. It was then that as she bent down to tie her shoes, everything went black. Lawrence had struck her over the head and Mary immediately fell into unconsciousness. The next thing she knew, she was in the back of the van and her hands were restrained behind her. What followed were acts so horrible I cannot mention them on YouTube. I will just say that what happened to Mary in the back of that van are things that no person should ever have to experience. When everything was done and Mary woke up, the van had stopped and Lawrence was pulling her out of the van. On the side of the road, she begged him to let her go. She begged him to please set me free. Lawrence responded to this by walking back to his van and coming back with a machete. He then shockingly held Mary down and swung the blade at the ground, severing Mary's right arm just below the elbow. He then did the exact same thing to her left arm. He then pushed her off a 30-foot embankment into a ravine. And if that wasn't enough, he shoved her into a concrete pipe. Once that was done, he said to her, There, now you're free. Lawrence then left her there. Mary then fell back into unconsciousness. Lawrence started his van and then left, assuming that she would very quickly succumb to her injuries. However, as shocking as that encounter may have been, 
even more shocking was that Mary wasn't dead. In fact, Mary woke back up and actually made her way out of that pipe. Realizing the severity of her predicament and knowing she could bleed out very quickly, she acted fast and pushed the stumps of her arms into mud to stop the bleeding. She began to make her way out of the ravine and attempted to get someone, anyone, to stop. But the first car only saw a young girl missing both of her arms, dirty and bloody, and quickly sped away out of fear. The second car thankfully stopped and quickly helped her in the car and wrapped her in a blanket. They rushed her to the nearest hospital and on the way there, Mary again faded into unconsciousness. Once arriving at the hospital, doctors actually thought Mary was dead. But then when they saw her breathing, they immediately rushed her into the operating room as they knew she had lost a lot of blood and didn't want to risk her body going into shock. Amazingly, Mary survived. And not only did she survive, but she remembered everything that happened. And more importantly, she remembers the name and the face of the man who was responsible for this horrible crime. Mary was able to give a detailed description of the attack and of her attacker. She even had his name and with that information, police quickly went to work. They fortunately were able to arrest him and during this time, Mary was recovering. She received prosthetic arms and even returned to school. Six months later, once Lawrence was arrested, he was then taken to trial where Mary herself testified against him and pointed out that he was the man responsible for the attack. Lawrence, being the coward that he was, tried blaming both Mary and then making up that another person was there and that they were the ones who attacked her and that he had nothing to do with it. Given his history of violence, the description that Mary gave, and several other pieces of evidence, Lawrence Singleton was convicted, but shockingly only received 14 years. It was the maximum sentence that was allowed at the time, but the judge actually went on record to say the following. If I had the power, I would send him to prison for the rest of his natural life. However, Lawrence Singleton, a monster who committed acts so horrible that they can't be mentioned, a man who changed a young woman's life forever, a man who showed no remorse and lied about even being involved, only served eight years before being released. Due to his poor health and good behavior, he was given an early release, but thankfully, his departure wasn't a smooth one. During his first year of probation, he was actually rejected from numerous different towns. In one instance, 400 residents of a neighboring town forced him out of the hotel that he was staying at. At another town, police had to actually intervene to get him to safety after the people of that town said that he wouldn't last a week if he stayed. He ended up having to serve his probation in a trailer literally on the grounds of the prison since nobody wanted him around. And to be honest, I can't blame any of them. And even then, the twisted story of Lawrence Singleton isn't over. After his probation was done, Lawrence eventually moved back to his home state of Florida. Yet he was unable to stay out of police radar. He was arrested twice for petty crimes of theft and spent the next few years existing and unfortunately taking up valuable oxygen. He continued living this way until 1997. In the spring of 1997, a neighbor of Lawrence's called the police to report screams coming from his home. Knowing his past, police rushed to the house and were met with a gruesome discovery. Roxanne Hayes, a mother of three, lay dead on the living room floor of Lawrence Singleton's home. She had been stabbed numerous times. And when police saw Lawrence, they described the scene as him being completely covered in blood. Lawrence was arrested and charged with the death of Roxanne Hayes. And at his trial, someone from Lawrence's past came back to make sure that this time he went away for life. Mary Vincent, who was now 34 years old, again took the stand and pointed out how he not only changed her life, but had now sadly taken the life of someone else. This testimony proved without any doubt that monsters like Lawrence Singleton do not deserve freedom. They don't deserve life. Thankfully, the justice system had changed since back in the 70s and Lawrence Singleton was given the death penalty. He died in 2001 of cancer 
and I can say that the world is a better place without him. The true hero of this story is Mary Vincent, who since her attack has gone on to not only be an advocate for victims of violent crimes, but has also had two sons of her own. She is now an artist which focuses on powerful portrayals of female action figures. To add even more to her badass resume, she even has made customized prosthetics including one for painting and another for bowling. Mary Vincent's story is one that, while tragic, shows courage, strength, and the resiliency of human life. These were four shocking stories and twisted tales. The stories of Ali Nassar Abulaban, Dorothy Jane Scott, Darsh Patel, and Mary Vincent are just a few of the shocking and unbelievable stories that have made their mark on history in one way or another. What may sound like something straight out of a crime novel or your worst nightmares can in fact be just as real as you or me.